Hello, this is the Absite and board review for malignant thyroid conditions, including thyroid surgery. I recommend watching the benign thyroid lecture first, as it goes over the anatomy and physiology more. Let's talk about thyroid surgery in general. Don't forget to do a laryngoscopy prior to thyroidectomy to check vocal cord function. Thyroidectomy is done by a collar incision two finger breadths above the sternal notch, raise subplatismal flaps, then divide the median raphe of the strap muscles down to the thyroid isthmus, then dissecting the right and or left lobes laterally and dividing the middle thyroid veins. The thyroid lobe is rolled up and the recurrent laryngeal nerve is identified. There are nerve monitoring devices that use special endotracheal tubes with sensors at the level of the vocal cords. Then on the surgical field, you have a little electric stimulation probe that can stimulate the recurrent laryngeal nerve if you touch right on it. And then the vocal cord stimulation will cause a beep on the machine. Studies have not shown obvious decrease in nerve injury with the use of these nerve monitoring devices, so they are used at the surgeon's discretion. Be sure the parathyroid glands are left in the patient. Once the recurrent laryngeal nerves are identified, then take down the inferior and superior pole vessels using ties or energy devices. Then roll the lobe up off the trachea. Postoperative questions that are high yield are, what to do if the patient develops airway obstruction just after extubation, but no hematoma in the neck? Then possibly you have a bilateral vocal cord paralysis from bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and immediately replace the endotracheal tube, and you may need to open the wound and place a tracheostomy. The next question would be, if a patient extubates well, but when in the PACU you get a call that the patient is desaturating and struggling with a big bulge in the anterior neck, then this is a post-op hematoma. The answer is to alert the OR that you will be coming right back, but right there in the PACU, use a suture removal kit to remove the surgical sutures in the skin and subdermal tissue and release the hematoma immediately. Next is how to screen for postoperative hypocalcemia. This occurs because most of the blood supply to the parathyroid glands comes from the inferior thyroid artery. No matter how hard you try, this blood supply gets damaged or interrupted during a total thyroidectomy, causing parathyroids to lose some function transiently. Some surgeons do routine postoperative ionized calcium checks every four to six hours to stay ahead of this, if the patient is staying in the hospital, ionized calcium is not dependent on serum albumin le levels, so it's better. If it's low, give IV calcium. Some surgeons discharge the same day. Probably early in your career, go ahead and keep a total thyroidectomy patient in-house overnight to watch for hypocalcemia and bleeding. Although remember that hypocalcemia may not show up for a few days after surgery. Sometimes surgeons go ahead and prophylactically put patients on oral calcium and vitamin D. Remember that if you round on the patient and they have low calcium, you can see circumoral paresthesia, Chavaz-Steck sign, which is twitching of the lip with tapping of the facial nerve on the cheek, or Trousseau's sign, which is spasm of the forearm with a blood pressure cuff on the forearm near the elbow. Severely low calcium can lead to cardiac arrhythmia, such as QT prolong prolongation and seizures. All right, now let's talk about thyroid cancer. Overall, I'd say there would be five thyroid cancer types you may be, as may be asked about. Papillary, follicular, herthal cell variant, medullary, and anaplastic. The well-differentiated thyroid cancers are usually referring to papillary and follicular, and these are the most common. The most common thyroid cancer representing 85% of all thyroid malignancy is papillary thyroid cancer. Papillary thyroid cancer is more common in women by three to one. Radiation increases risk. For example, neck irradiation used to be used for acne many years ago, or is also seen in areas like Chernobyl that have high levels of environmental radiation. Papillary thyroid cancer can be a diagnosis on FNA, purely based on cytology. The cytology findings usually associated with papillary thyroid cancer are orphan anti-nuclei, somoma bodies, and nuclear palisading. 
Papillary thyroid cancer tends to be multifocal in up to 80% of cases. There has been recent data showing improved survival with total thyroidectomy for lesions over one centimeter in size. Other high-risk characteristics of papillary thyroid cancer would be age older than 45, previous neck irradiation, multiple nodules on imaging, high grade, or any evidence of extrathyroidal spread, whether via direct extension through the capsule of the thyroid gland or metastatic regional nodes or distant METs. If the patient has any of these high-risk features or extrathyroidal spread and a size over one centimeter, then I think it is safe to answer to say you would do a total thyroidectomy. The central neck compartment, or level six on the ipsilateral side of the disease, should be included if possible. Lateral neck dissection of levels two, three, and four should be done for clinically palpable or radiographically enlarged nodes. A lateral aberrant thyroid rest is an old term for a biopsy of a lateral neck lymph node showing thyroid tissue. This is metastatic papillary thyroid cancer. Papillary thyroid cancer likes to metastasize first to lymphatics, then to lung and bone. You can do a radioactive iodine uptake scan to localize metastatic disease. Age is important in staging well-differentiated thyroid cancer. The T stages are T1 is less than two centimeters, T2 is two to four centimeters, T3 is greater than four centimeters not invading critical structures, and T4 invades critical structures. If a patient is younger than 55, they can only be a stage one without distant metastatic disease or a stage two with distant metastatic disease, regardless of tumor size or nodal status. The usual TNM classification applies after age 55. Now let's talk about the other well-differentiated thyroid cancer which is follicular thyroid cancer and is 10% of thyroid malignancies. Follicular thyroid cancer cannot be differentiated from a benign follicular adenoma on FNA alone. The reason is that you, in order to call it follicular cancer, you have to see vascular invasion or invasion of the capsule of the tumor into the surrounding thyroid tissue. Like I mentioned in the benign thyroid video, Sometimes the term FLUS, or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, is given to nodules that have features of follicular cancer versus follicular adenoma and are sometimes classified in that indeterminate category on FNA. There is newer molecular testing that can sometimes tell you if it is more likely to be a follicular cancer. The safest answer is still to say diagnostic thyroid lobectomy for FLUS or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. I would mention the caveat of molecular testing, and if a very low risk lesion is on molecular testing, the high specificity of these tests means that it is unlikely this is a follicular thyroid cancer. If you do a diagnostic lobectomy and it is follicular cancer, then take the patient back for completion total thyroidectomy. If you know it is a follicular thyroid cancer and it's over one centimeter in size, I would answer that a total thyroidectomy is the surgery of choice. Follicular cancer spreads primarily via the hematogenous route. For both the well-differentiated thyroid cancers, after a total thyroidectomy, the decision is then whether to use radioactive iodine. Hard indications for radioactive iodine would be large thyroid tumors over four centimeters in size, positive lymph nodes, or clear metastatic disease. Typically, they start by doing a radioactive iodine uptake scan with low doses of radioactive iodine, around 5 millicuries. This will show where the lesions are and if there is uptake, how strong the uptake is, and thus how well the radioactive iodine ablation should work. It is best to have high TSH levels when the radioactive iodine is given. This is done either by holding the T3 or T4 replacement and waiting for the TSH to rise naturally, or more, more commonly now, giving recombinant TSH. The recombinant TSH is nice because holding thyroid replacement, waiting for the body to produce naturally higher TSH, makes the patients feel terrible. Then the ra ablative radioactive iodine dose, 
ranges from 30 to 100 millicuries, which is 10 times more radioactive iodine than the scan, you cannot give radioactive iodine as effectively if you only did a hemithyroidectomy because the remaining thyroid lobe will suck up all of the radioactive iodine and it won't get to the microscopic metastatic disease. You cannot use radioactive iodine in children since it increases future cancer risk or in pregnant or lactating mothers because the radioactive iodine can destroy the infant's thyroid and cause cretinism. Again, radioactive iodine is really only used for the well-differentiated thyroid cancers, papillary and follicular cancer. It does not work well for all the rest, such as herthal, medullary, or anaplastic. Also, after a total thyroidectomy, you can follow serum thyroglobulin levels. Thyroglobulin is a glycoprotein that is a component of the colloid matrix within the thyroid follicle. If you don't do a total thyroidectomy, you can't follow it as accurately for recurrence since you have normal thyroid gland left. But if you do a total thyroidectomy, you can follow serum thyroglobulin levels. If they start to go up, then do a radioactive iodine uptake scan to see if something lights up. Patients obviously take thyroxine after total thyroidectomy to maintain normal thyroid function. This also helps to keep the TSH low which helps suppress thyroid cancer regrowth. TSH should be suppressed to less than 0.1 milliunits per liter for high-risk patients. Next, let's talk about the Herthal cell variant. This is usually considered a subset of follicular thyroid cancer. 80% are benign Herthal cell adenomas, but you cannot make determinations on FNA, so you need a thyroid lobectomy to differentiate. Pathology shows Ashkenazi cells and abundance of oncocytic or oxophilic cells. It tends to be resistant to radioactive iodine and has a worse prognosis because they tend to be multifocal, more likely to metastasize. You need to know about medullary thyroid cancer, which is 5 to 10% of thyroid malignancies. It develops from the parafollicular C cells, so it makes the chemical calcitonin, which can be measured in the blood. Calcitonin can cause flushing and diarrhea. Pathology shows calcifications, abundant collagen, and amyloid deposition. Medullary thyroid cancer is inherited in 20 to 30 percent of cases through genetic mutations such as the RET proto-oncogene and through the MEN syndromes. Remember that MEN 2A is the C's. Calcium for parathyroid hyperplasia, calcitonin for medullary thyroid cancer, and catecholamines for pheochromocytoma. MEN 2B is mucosal neuromas, medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytomas, and marfanoid, ba marfanoid body habitus. For known MEN patients, remove the thyroid gland prophylactically at six years for MEN 2A and at two years of age for MEN 2B. The surgery for medullary thyroid cancer is always a total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection, which is removal of the nodal tissue between each recurrent laryngeal nerve from the inferior border of the thyroid down to the thym thymus gland. In MEN2 patients, medullary thyroid cancer is multicentric in 90% of the patients, and in patients with palpable nodules, more than 70% have nodal metastasis. Sporadic medullary thyroid cancer has slightly less multicentricity than MEN2, but they still get a total thyroidectomy. Do an ipsilateral modified radical neck dissection if a palpable thyroid mass, or bilateral neck dissections if bilateral tumors or extrathyroidal disease is present. Radioactive iodine is not useful in medullary thyroid cancer, so it is not used either for radioactive iodine scans or for treatment. Monitor calcitonin serum levels for recurrence. Lastly, anaplastic thyroid cancer is basically a sarcoma of the thyroid and is the most aggressive thyroid cancer. There's not much to know for the abscite other than it is about 2% of all thyroid cancers. It is usually in the elderly and it's often unresectable. All anaplastic thyroid cancer is considered stage four and carries a dismal survival of only four to six months. And commonly, the only surgery you can do is a palliative tracheostomy. 
Most of the treatment for anaplastic thyroid cancer relies on chemo with doxorubicin, cisplatin, and external beam radiation. All right, that's it. I hope that helps. Thanks for listening.